Senator Brasso. Well, I just want to follow the direction of your questioning, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Ms. Stevens, you know, your company is very confident that it's going to be able to generate electricity for fusion. Uh, more and more companies are getting into, the, into this area. In May of 2023, uh, your company entered into this power purchase agreement to provide electricity to Microsoft around 2028. Uh, to date, no one has been able to generate electricity from fusion, yet last year you announced that it is expected to demonstrate the ability to produce electricity in, in 2024, which is, which is this year. Are, are you still on track to show it can produce electricity by the end of this year? We're talking, you know, less than two and a half months to go. Thank you for that question, Senator. Right now, we're constructing our seventh prototype called Polaris. And this is the machine that we expect will demonstrate electricity production. We are on track to complete construction of this plant this year and begin testing likely this year and then continue that through next year. Um, and yes, this is the machine that we believe will, will demonstrate electricity production, which is key to meeting the requirements of that PPA. So since we sometimes ask one witness to comment on something or another, Dr. White, you know, companies like Helion generated significant excitement. Uh, about their prospects for fusion energy. Um, are we really just a few years away from bringing fusion energy onto the grid? Great, thank you for the question, Senator. I think this is where the topic of technology innovation really becomes uh, the most important issue to discuss. Companies like Helion are using innovative approaches to generating fusion energy, but a lot of that is based on innovative technology approaches. And these are things that we're going to discover through the development, demonstration, and testing process. And so I think it's really exciting to watch the progress that Helion is making in this space and ultimately be looking to them as they test their machines to see if they can perform and produce the electricity that they believe could be really impactful. And I think this is something across the space. How can we look to innovative technologies to really accelerate fusion, not just for Helion, but for many of the different private fusion companies in the space? But ultimately, the proof will be in electrons on the grid. Great. So, so good to make Siemens, the, the power purchase agreement that you have with Microsoft. I think lots of people are interested to learn the specifics of the, these agreements. You know, I'm curious to know whether the agreement includes a firm deadline date by which Helion must provide electricity to Microsoft and interested to know whether it, it includes meaningful penalties if you don't meet the deadline. What, if any, details can you share about the agreement? Sure. Um, I can't share, share every detail of the agreement, but I can say that, yes, this indeed is a real PPA that comes with firm penalties. Um, we do have penalties that evolve and change as we grow closer to the milestone of actually producing commercial power for, for Microsoft. Um, and yes, we do have deadlines. So for 2028, we need to have the plant constructed and begin operations and then reach full commercial operations providing electricity to Microsoft in 2029. Uh, Dr. White, earlier this year, uh, Representative Beyer from Virginia, you know, he's co-chair of the House Fusion Energy Caucus. Um, he said that much of the U.S. fusion spending goes to legacy programs, not the, he, I think mean, his quote was, not the cutting edge stuff. Um, is it time for Congress to reorder our priorities uh, when it comes to fusion research? Thank you. So I think it's really important when we talk about a lot of these legacy programs, as was described by Representative Beyer, and thinking about the larger fusion energy portfolio, how can we try to refocus what their activities are towards fusion energy commercialization? A lot of the machines that we operate today and a lot of the international programs that we're in can provide really important scientific and engineering information to help accelerate the private industry. Insights and work done at ITER on the design, manufacturing, construction of the ITER device, and a lot of the design work that was done to support that could be incredibly valuable for U.S. private fusion companies. The question is, how can we make sure that U.S. private companies in the U.S. fusion energy sector can get access to a lot of these lessons learned? And I think when we talk about U.S. fusion energy experiments, how can we make sure that they're really tailored and focused on either training scientists, producing research, or testing the system structures and components that are going to be needed for fusion energy. And so I think a lot of it is really having this focused plan on how to best use both the legacy experiments and the international collaborations that we have. So, uh, Dr. Lyon, yeah. yes. Uh, you know, like it's no surprise how China's approaching fusion. Uh, just like they've done with other innovative technologies, they, they let, us, uh, let us do all the hard work and then they try to copycat it, mm -hmm. steal it in anything they can. They steal our ideas, they lock up the supply chains for raw materials, <laughs> magnets, capacitors, semiconductors, you, you know all of this, the list goes on. What's, what's the Department of Energy going to do to protect America's growing energy fusion industry, our industry? Yeah, thank you, Senator, for that question. And, and I think it, it connects with a lot of the comments here as well. It, what we have to do is we have to be very focused on making sure that we're not only just closing the science and technology gaps, but that we have a roadmap, a direction 
that provides us not just the timeline, but the way that we prioritize. Uh, the the le so-called legacy uh, assets that we have, these are not just facilities, these are ecosystems. And what's really important to recognize, these ecosystems are working not just on fusion science, they're working also on development of the very tools that are enabling many of the private uh, sector companies. Those ecosystems as well are what ties us to our international partners and in fact, why the globe and why the world comes to the United States for many of their projects for us to be able to develop them. The key piece here is basically, as was just shared here by my colleagues, is making sure that we're understanding the bridge to the private sector, identifying where those gaps have to be addressed and making sure we take advantage of the resources and the assets that already exist. Well, th um, Mr. Chairman, thanks for going to seven minutes because I have two more questions. Uh, Ms. Sebas, I, I understand fusion companies have raised over $7 billion now acro across the board from uh, the private sector. What types of metrics do investors use when they're trying to assess you know, different companies' performance? Thank you for that great question. Um, and it gives me a chance to talk about the diligence that we went through with both of our customers. We actually started talking to Nucor as an example back in 2021 and went through a very, very, uh, you know, in-depth process with them, sharing what we could with them to have them in a place where they felt comfortable and excited about signing uh, an energy development agreement with us for that 500 megawatt plant. Similarly with Microsoft, same thing. Uh, both of these companies are, are very conservative and are very serious about uh, announcing and pursuing an agreement of this type with us moving forward. And Dr. White, my final question. So, you know, some people say nuclear fusion is inherently safe. Um, could you discuss a little bit safety benefits as well as potential hazards associated with fusion technology? Thank you so much for that question, Senator Brasso. I spent three years on my doctoral thesis working on it, so I'll help, help to give you the quick highlights version of it. There we go. Um, <laughs> I'll go very quickly. Um, really, it's when you start looking at fusion reactions, they are producing, at least with some reactions, neutrons. And those neutrons that are produced can have the property of activating materials, causing them to become radioactive, and then producing additional forms of radiation. The challenge there is we need to make sure that we have a way to control and confine that type of radiation that's produced and have a pathways for its disposal in the long term. We need to make sure that we're producing or protecting workers, public, and the environment for any materials that might be produced as byproducts during the fusion reactions and in fusion machines. The other thing that we'll need to consider is the tritium that is used in some fusion fuel cycles is a radioactive form of hydrogen. While we have experience in the United States with handling tritium safely, we need to make sure that we continue those processes as we scale it up to industrial fusion energy. And so I think we do have pathways on how to maintain safety, but it is something that's gonna to need to be a continued focus as we think about commercialization and fusion energy. But luckily we have organizations like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that are focused on this and are developing the regulations and guidance necessary as well as the agreement states that are gonna take a leading role in the licensing of fusion energy technology in the near term. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman.